Good evening and welcome to the Marty Heiser Show. You know, on September 11th, 2001, every one of us can remember when we saw those images, when we've heard for the first time that our nation was under attack. And yet in our area here, right in Fairfield County, there were young men like Brian R. Bill of Stamford, Connecticut, that answered the call when his country was under attack. Tonight, the first half of this show, we're going to talk about an amazing young man who went to Norwich University. You're going to learn a little bit about this school up in the heart of the liberal state of Vermont, right there in the middle of it. In North, Northfield, Vermont, there is a college that has been training young men that are interested in a career in the military for many, many years. You're going to hear from one of uh, Brian's classmates from Norwich University. You're going to hear from his childhood priest and also a young man that's putting on a golf outing right here at Sterling Farms uh, Golf Course. So we're going to talk to all of these men, but before we do, we have on the line Captain Drew Bissett. Now, for those of you who have never heard of Captain Bissett, he has a mentoring program for Navy SEALs. And he has mentored somewhere, well, let me ask him. Captain, are you there? I am here. Captain, uh, we're, we have a picture of uh, Brian R. Bill up, and that's going to be dominating the television screen in just a minute. What are your remembrances of, of Brian uh, when he was aspiring to become a Navy SEAL, and uh, what can you tell us about him? Well, he was a terrific young man. He, uh, he had what I call a tremendous heart. Uh, it's interesting, I was talking to one of his um, <clears throat> classmates from Trinity Catholic High School, actually a teammate on the hockey team, the other co-captain, John Schofield, and he had this to describe of Brian that I thought was extremely accurate. And he said, you know, he said, um, Brian was, uh, you know, co-captain of the hockey team, and he um, <clears throat> was always empowering his teammates to reach beyond their limits. Um, whatever they lacked, in t whatever he lacked in talent, he would compensate with heart. He was the type of guy. He was the ultimate team player. He wasn't the star that scored the winning goal, but rather the one that provided the assist that scored that goal. And uh, he, this is the type of. So he was always <clears throat> just his leadership by example out there on the on the ice, constantly in motion moving, never quitting, just inspired his teammates. And this, this he carried on when he came down to our mentoring program, uh, worked tremendously hard to get the best screen test scores that he could in order to enter the SEAL training. And then, of course, when he went on to serve with his teammates in combat and so forth, he was always inspiring them. Now, uh, for people that don't know, you have a, a rather strenuous mentoring program for young men that have it in their mind that they want to become Navy SEALs. And my understanding of it is that out of 100 people that attempt to become SEALs, somewhere around 15 or 20 actually make it through. But the young men that have gone through your mentoring program, it's almost the reverse of that, that 100 people have gone through. Well, how many have and how many have ended up becoming SEALs? Well, actually, we've recommended 160 candidates over the past 17 years that we've been doing this, and we've graduated 110. And the other significant thing is that about 5% of the SEALs aspire to this command that uh, Brian Bill was part of, which is Dev Group, which is our most elite SEAL team. And I would say 10%, and only about, as I said, only about 5% of SEALs uh, that are on active duty are are part of this command and um, in our program 10% of our candidates have gone on to become div group uh, operators. Wow so now SEAL Team 6 as I read up about the tragic events of August 6th last year not even a year ago but the uh, the Navy SEALs that lost their life as that, as that helicopter the Chinook helicopter was shot done down in that group was SEAL Team 6. Can you just describe briefly what SEAL Team 6 is all about? Well, we like to, we like to uh, call them Dev Group. Using, using that name that you're using is almost a classified situation. But uh, that is our- Captain, not that many people watch this show. I think we're good. <laughs> but um, uh, this is our most elite SEAL team. And uh, these, 
guys, um, basically, uh, their whole mission is counterterrorism. And that's what they're all about. Wow. Well, listen, thank you so much for taking your time. Is it? Are you down in Arlington uh, this weekend? Ha something having to do with uh, Brian Bill? No. Uh, um, his, um, his parents are down there. Okay. I'm not. I'm down here in uh, Stanford getting ready. Basically, I've been uh, preparing for this uh, <coughs> fundraising event that Norwich is putting on here next Thursday. Yeah, which uh, we have uh, William McIntosh, who's here from Norwich University, talking about the golf tournament at Sterling Farms Golf Course on uh, June 14th that's coming up. So we're going to relentlessly flog that as well. Oh, great. I hope you do, because uh, I, hope, I hope some of the listeners will participate in that event. It's going to be a great event. All right. Well, listen, thank you for taking the time to call in. I appreciate it very much. You're quite welcome. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thanks. Wow. Well, that's Captain Drew Bissett. Um, he is a former Navy SEAL, and he also mentors and trains uh, young men that are aspiring to be Navy SEALs. And he had a, a uh, unique involvement in Brian Bill's life and uh, has many fond memories of him. But let me just uh, introduce Father Futi. You do. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. William uh, McIntosh, as we talked about, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, um, the golf outing, and then Captain Ben Owen. Now, Ben, could you just, uh, you were a, a friend of Brian's at Norwich University. Could you, for our vast viewing audience, could you just describe Norwich University, what it is, what it stands for, and how you got to know uh, uh, Brian a little bit? Sure. Well, uh, Norwich University, it's a private uh, academy that trains cadets and both civilians. Um, I mean, it's a great program, and like you mentioned at the uh, beginning of the show, I mean, training young leaders, especially since uh, the attacks in 2003, mm -hmm. to uh, make combat leaders and make sure that they're ready to uh, lead soldiers once they get into those, uh, into those areas. Mm -hmm. um, I knew Brian. Um, we swam together at Norwich for two years. And uh, like I told you at the beginning, it was an interesting dynamic. He was an upperclassman. I was a, a freshman. Um, I was a rook at the time, which is the you know, West Point's equivalent of a plebe. So very. Can, can I dynamic. just interject just briefly? <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, now a rook is a freshman at Norwich University. And by the way, if we can get a shot of this picture, one of these pictures is his cadet mm -hmm. portrait at Norwich University. The other is as, as a Navy SEAL. But when you're a fresh, yeah, here we go. This is this is him as, as a cadet right there, and mm -hmm. uh, this is him later as a SEAL. But when you're a rook at Norwich University, among other things, just describe to our viewing audience. It's what it means to walk in the gutter. Uh, uh, Bill, you have a little insight into this, too. Walking the gutter, what is walking, that exactly? Walking the gutter is any time that you're outside and you walk outside your building, um, wherever you go, they have the little six-inch, you know, uh, siding there where you're basically having to hug the corner. And uh, rain, snow, it doesn't matter. As a freshman, you got to walk in the little gutter all the way around campus, and, and you can't step off the pavement until you uh, become a, until you're and recognized. So, but I mean, when you get to eat in the cafeteria, yeah. that's your time to relax and unwind uh, no. as a rook, isn't it? <laughs> no, now you're getting to uh, ask Sergeant Salt and Corporal Pepper if you can sit down at the table, and <laughs> once you get your meals, square in your meals, and... Uh, having your cadre watch you as you're doing that and make any corrections. So you know, it's funny when when you begin to look into the life of Brian R. Bill and mm -hmm. and and what he did. I mean, he went to first of all, he went to Trinity Catholic High School in Stanford. He played on the hockey team, which is always good. You got to like a hockey player. You gotta. <laughs> and uh, and then, but then he, he's seeking out challenges every step of the way. He goes to Norwich University, and truth be told, my son went there too. So I had a little insight yeah. into this whole rook thing and yeah. memorizing stuff and can't <laughs> sit back and anything an upperclassman tells you to do, you got to do. I mean, it's pretty strenuous. You know, the dog river, doing push-ups, bringing a rock out, it's a whole big thing. But from there, he goes into the Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. And if that isn't enough going through BUDS, he wants to go even higher. He goes into this dev group or SEAL Team 6, which is the most elite of the elite. That's the unit that went in and took out Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. But that's not enough either. He teaches himself French. He teaches himself Russian. He, he, hide, he, he uh, climbed something like three out of the tallest seven peaks in the, in, on the planet. And he wanted to do more. He got his pilot's license. I mean, this guy was no joke. Father, what, what, was, what was your reminiscence of him, and what was he like as a child? I have to tell you now, I'm a priest 30 years this year. God bless. Thank you. We need more of that. 
but in 30 years, I have handled thousands of kids. Uh -huh. you know, programming, education, all kinds of programs. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you, this is the one you took the double take for. Mm -hmm. There was something about him that was so incredible right from the start that when he, he just came down the street, at that point I was an assistant priest at St. Cecilia Parish in mm -hmm. Stanford. Mm -hmm. When I was there, I was at my desk one day. I, I remember this time. And I was working at my desk. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden the door opens. This teenager comes bouncing into the office. Hi, I'm Brian Bill. Can I help you in some way? Looking for some volunteer work that he can do. Wow. Just Now this is not something that happens as a parish priest uh, every well, day. You know, you have the, the kids in the school. Uh -huh. You have them in the, in the CYO. You have them uh, with catechetical instruction, some field trips. Mm -hmm. But he just, he just walked in. He literally came down the street. He lived up the street. Mm -hmm. Came in, and I just looked, and I said, there is something more than meets the eye here. Yeah. And then we began, We really started rolling. He really was the son I never had. Wow. wow. He really, really was. Wow. Um, he was capable in all those things that you just mentioned. Yeah. But also fr uh, piano and guitar. Oh, yeah, yeah. And taught himself by ear. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Taught himself by ear on how to do that. Mm -hmm. At the time of his death, he was looking for a way on how to circumnavigate the globe in a sailboat. Wow. And Brian's first love obviously was the military. Yeah. But he had all of this tremendous capacity within him. And it seemed, you knew it took effort, uh -huh. but it seemed to come almost effortless. Wow. Because he put his mind to it. Yeah. And he became a, a perfect lesson of you can do anything you put your mind to do. When he would go at something, he went at it wholeheartedly and with sincerity. There was tremendous compassion in the man also. Mm -hmm. um, the time of his funeral, um, during the wake, a, a young man had uh, just happened to drop a note off to his parents mm. and then left after paying respects. And uh, the young gentleman had said he had had problems in school. Mm -hmm. And you know the way kids are in school, all of a sudden you ostracize that person. Sure, yeah. He said only one person would talk to me. Wow. This man. Brian Bell. This man, this boy, this man, this naval officer. Wow. This incredible individual who could give heart and soul to whatever he did. As a kid he had to come to me one time at in high school, he was ready for the big announcement to me. What am I going to do after high school? What are you going to do your life kind of thing? Okay, Brian. Yeah. What's, what, are you, what are you going to do? Tell me. He says, Father, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. Easier said than done. No, I, what did I know? I didn't yeah. know that much about the SEALs, right? Uh -huh. So I thought first, all right, he could be somewhat reserved, and I wanted more out of him, but it had to come from him. Right, right, right. I said, I wanted, and you know, I'm an Italian. I was looking for, you know, the other kids would be all over me and, you yeah. know, who's pummeling your back and who wants to box with you and who wants to wrestle with you. And, you know. Right, right, right. Brian was always off to the side. I said, now I have my chance. So I said, well, really, Brian, you want to be a SEAL? Um, is this going to mean you have to go to college for this? Are you not going to go to college? He said, oh, no, I have to go to college. It's very arduous. Oh. A lot of training, Father. A lot of, a lot of discipline. Uh -huh. Oh. And he said, all that? And he said, yeah. I said, well, I don't see why you have to do all that simply to sit on a stool and beg for a sardine and flap your flippers. <laughs> now, he looked at me as if I was the biggest idiot ever, <laughs> like, stunned, right? And you didn't I, have an appreciation of the grandeur uh, <laughs> that is a Navy SEAL. So I, when he was stunned, then I gave him a smirky smile that tried to copy his, and I tilted my head. Uh -huh. He got up and threw his arms around me. Oh, I, okay. I got him. Uh -huh. I got him. But it was that so what, sort of well, thing. What, well, what was his thinking behind choosing a military uh, path? Did he ever share that with you? He just said he wants to be a SEAL. One time I said to him, yeah. Brian, did we say this, I'm, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. Yeah. I said, Brian, yeah. Father would never want you to be crushed by disappointment. Yeah. But the Navy doesn't hand this out like candy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He says, 
I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. I said, I will be proud of whatever you do yeah. to, the, to the best of your ability. Yeah. Even if you don't get that, we'll all be proud of you because you tried. I am going to be a Navy SEAL. And that was him. Bill McIntosh, what is the motto, speaking of what you just said, of Norwich University? I will try. I will try. That's the motto of Norwich University. And uh, what was your experience at Norwich? Uh, what made you decide to put yourself through rook year and uh, uh, play on their very uh, prominent uh, hockey program, I would say, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, my father went there in 1967, I graduated in 67, I mean, and uh, he was, uh, became one of the board of trustees at Norwich. Oh, okay. So I actually. So it's the only school you could get into, really. Pretty much. Okay. Pretty I much. understand you know. that. I had similar situation. Yeah. ACTs weren't quite what you wanted. No. I'm well, just I went to the I went to the I went to the Air Force Academy first. And, oh, see. And see. and, and so I, I I decided that at uh, my freshman year I went through Rookdom at the Air Force Academy, and huh. decided that I I didn't like the academy, so I decided to go to my dad's alma mater because. Tony Mariano, the at the time was the coach of Norwich University, uh -huh. said the hockey we, coach, the hockey coach okay. said we want you here. Okay. So uh, I became first line my freshman year at, at Norwich, wow. and uh, you know it was just an amazing experience. Now to give people a little idea, Norwich University on, on uh, the hockey program, how many national championships have they had in the last ten years? Like three? Three or four? Yeah, uh, they've been in the in the running, you know, in the last ten years, you know, pretty much every year. Yeah, I mean, you know. actually, there's a guy right now who I believe plays for the Washington Capitals. Keith Elcoin. There you go, and he, he played at Norwich yeah. University too. So this is a high level of hockey. It's a high level of hockey, and then Brian playing there as well, I mean, it's just an amazing you know, thing for him. You know, being on the swim team and, and the hockey team, is, it's, it's so very rigorous. So he played rigorous. on the hockey team in Norwich as well? That's what I was, I was told, I uh, believe. I know, I know he played at, uh, at uh, Stanford, uh, or at Trinity Catholic. Yes, he played for Trinity Catholic as well. But what, what, what did, how did Norwich, uh, you know, mold you, and how, how do you see it reflected in the life of, of Brian Bill? And what are you trying to do with this golf outing? Well, uh, I'll tell you a little bit of background. You know, in 1995, I graduated from Norwich University, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I always believe that you can do anything if you set your mind to it. Right. So when I heard that this had happened, the, you know, as soon as they said, you know, they need someone to help, to, you know, to go out there and to actually put the scholarship tournament together, I automatically put my foot you know, forward for it. Uh -huh. you know, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. I, 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 but I tell you, it, it is something that I know I could never have done. I mean, the strength that it takes, the character that it takes to get there is just a whole other level. Yeah. Uh, in 1996, I skated across America on inline skates because I wanted to do something to make a difference in the world. Right. And I saw that, when I saw what Brian Bill had done in his life, I just said, I need to make a difference here. This wow. is, you know. So we're doing a, a scholarship golf tournament to leave a legacy for Brian Bill. Um, and his family has pledged to do this, and I think it's just an amazing thing, you know, not even a year after his, his, his passing, to me, is, is just showing the character of the whole family. Yeah. Um, I was reading a little bit about um, uh, their, their uh, charity that they've set up, and I think it's really good. It's, it's the, for fallen seals, their children. A lot of these Navy SEALs, much like Brian, who, who never did get married, never did have, have kids of his own, but I would imagine he would have made a great father. Um, but they want to do uh, some types of uh, adventure activities with the kids, you know, camping, hunting, fishing, mountain climbing, and and I think the charity that they're they're setting up. Well, what what does the money go to? Well, this one specifically is made is, is set up for Norwich That's University um, to to donate specifically to go That's directly possible. to a, a student uh, that is either of a Navy SEAL family right. or uh, specifically uh, uh, to an individual that has is, is shown the character that Brian Bill has shown in his life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're going to probably, our goal is to raise a million dollars over the course of 10 years right. through the scholarship tournament. Mm -hmm. So if we can raise $100,000 a year for 10 years, in Brian Bill's name, we leave a legacy, and we leave a legacy for Brian that lasts forever. Okay. Now, now, people, they on the TV right now. It says uh, alumni Norwich uh, .edu. Um, That's where they can get in touch with with you regarding the. Yeah, they can go. Running. They can go right to the alumni uh, .norwich .edu backslash 2012 Brian Bill. Okay. Uh, but they really, you can just Google Brian Bill yeah. Golf Scholarship, and it comes up as number one. So okay. you can go directly to that. There's a link that you can actually go right to the tournament, register, sponsor, donate, 
Um, there's very, you know, it's very easy. And the tournament's going to be, uh, it's actually next Thursday, a week from a week from today. It's at Sterling Farms Golf Course right there in Stanford. You're familiar with uh, Sterling Farms. Are you going to be at the golf tournament? I shall be there. Right. Matter of fact, you, ironically. Are, you, are we playing tomorrow or do you got to get a babysitter with Beck over there? <laughs> yeah, we got to get a babysitter. We got to work this out. I, I mean, know, come yeah. on, you know. I know. Don't, don't hey, I'm you telling you. Um, and you'll be I'll playing the golf outing magic. as well. We'll be playing. We have uh, 144 golfers. Right now we have, I think, four or five foursomes left to, to fill. That's it. Right. Uh, we did this in six weeks. You know, it was a very, yeah. you know, quick, we're going to do this. Let's get it done. And we put it together. Uh, we have over $40,000 in sponsors. Um, so we're going we're gonna to hit our goals. Um, we have hundreds. I mean, literally, we have uh, over 100, I think, uh -huh. auction items. Okay. Um, so it's going to be pretty amazing. Talk to my wife after the show. She'll give you all the information. We'll have an auction item, you know, one of those power wash things, you know. So we'll put <laughs> that in there. Details to follow. Ben, tell me a little bit more about your uh, reminiscence of Brian at Norwich University. I mean, did he pick on you when you were a rook? Uh, did he show you a little <laughs> compassion? Like, I mean, the father is making him out to be, you know, yeah. uh, St. Francis yeah. Assisi revisited, you know, which is what you need to do. <laughs> but what was he really like? I mean, you know, uh, tell us what you remember. Uh, yeah, one of the biggest things I remember about Brian is um, one of the things Norwich really tries to uh, – instilling their leaders as being that quiet professional and that's what brian was i can remember in swim practice always on time worked hard uh every practice but uh actually he was one of those upperclassmen that kind of took us you know took several of us freshmen you know uh i wouldn't say necessarily by the hand but really kind of took care of us you know when it was time to uh just the way that things went, you know, having to be in bed late and do all those kind of things. He, he really made sure that we were taken care of and rested up before swim meets and we weren't, you know, what we would call getting smoked or whatever like that uh -huh. before swim meets and things like that. So, I mean, it, it was great. I mean, he, he, he did a nice job of taking care of us. So, yeah. I mean, that, that was the sense. I mean, even, uh, you know, if we go back to the events that happened on August 6th, 2011, uh -huh. Um, as I read about uh, um, when he lost his life, uh, basically defending our freedoms. You know, I mean, sometimes these, these wars in Afghanistan have, have gone on yeah. for so long that people don't really realize it. I mean, we, yeah. I had a very close friend who died uh, in uh, Tower One. He worked for Cantor Fitzgerald. And this was something, this wasn't some far off war that no one really knew why. I mean, this was a war that was brought to our shores in a very real way. And, and I'm, I am just so proud to, to be associated, or at least have known through the, your associations of someone like Brian Bill. And, I, and as I read articles about his parents and, and so forth, they really want to have his life be an inspiration, have his life be uh, something that would be emulated, that would be celebrated. I remember reading a little bit about his mother, and she says, you know, people don't know what to say, so they don't say anything. And she says, I want to talk about my son. I want to talk about what he lived for and the bravery and the courage that he showed going out. He had three bronze stars with the V for valor uh, uh, in, in his military career. He would go out uh, with, this, with these SEALs team night after night on these night raids. And then on August 6th, it was one of those night raids after they had, uh, they had uh, um, tried to uh, get some Taliban's and they were pulling out in a Chinook helicopter and it was like a lucky shot. They took out the rear uh, rotor of the helicopter and all on board were lost. I think it was some 38 uh, people were lost, 22 were Navy SEALs and, and he died. But he died fighting terrorism that has affected this region, this country in a very real way. So, listen, I want to thank you so much for coming in uh, and, and just taking some time. Playing the golf tournament. We got another uh, auction item sponsor. Just see uh, my lovely assistant on the way out. And, uh, and thanks a lot for sharing your mem rem thanks for remembrances. Me. Really appreciate it. Stay with us. Uh, we're going to take a, a brief bit break right now, and we will be right back with the Ridgefield Boys and Girls Club and the Samaritan Health Center. You won't want to leave. And after all, this is free television, so what else are you going to do? We'll give you updates on the Miami Heat game. I think they're going down. We'll be right back. Stay tuned.
second helpings. No streets paved with gold. No promise. No certainty. In this state, life is a bitter struggle to survive with the least. It's home to one out of every 11 families in America. It's home to one out of every six children in America. It's home to more than 32 million people. It's the state of American poverty. And if you were poor, you'd be home by now. Why is it you two have so much trouble communicating? I don't like the way he talks to me. He doesn't have to use that kind of language. All I said was that you had a big osteo fight. <laughs> oh, okay, well, what about the secrets you kept from me? Oh, so I didn't tell you about my drug allergies. Big that deal. That could have been nasty. Ooh. Okay, okay. So, how come I always have to go to your place? I'd be happy to come to you, Judith. I can't fit the x-ray machine in my car. <clears throat> How's your shoulder doing, anyway? Fine. Yeah? I worked up to three-pound dumbbells yesterday. Really? Oh. Just three weeks after surgery, that's pretty good. Yeah? Communication is the best medicine. A message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Group hug. I'm Major Samantha Weeks. I get to live my dream every day of being an Air Force fighter pilot and flying the most advanced aircraft in the world. Before I could ever climb into the Thunderbird F-16, I had to prove my flying skills through intense training, hard work, and determination. The road to my goal was long and challenging, but the reward is out of sight. You too can live your dream and accomplish anything when you set your mind to it. I thought indoor tanning was safe. They said their tanning rays were less likely to cause a sunburn. What you need to know is UV light from indoor tanning can cause premature aging, including wrinkles, sagging, and age spots. So instead of making you look cool, it can make you look old. And even worse, UV light can increase your risk of skin cancer, including melanoma, the deadliest form of skin cancer, especially when exposed at an early age. And treatment can be surgery, and sometimes even chemotherapy and radiation. In fact, current estimates are that one in five Americans develop skin cancer. And one person dies from melanoma about every hour. I don't want to be one of them. I don't want to be one of them. I don't want to be one of them. This message brought to you by the American Academy of Dermatology. I'm telling you, indoor tanning is not as safe as you think. In fact, Indoor tanning is totally out. You don't think we've overprepared, do you? Uh, good evening. Welcome back to the Marty Heiser Show. You know, there are so many reasons to want to live in Ridgefield, Connecticut. This, that's right, 06877 is the best zip code in the whole wide world. Don't you guys agree? Yeah. All right, and one of the big reasons is because you have young people like that, and the Boys and Girls Club in Ridgefield, Connecticut is second to none. And we have Kristen Gon Concalvis and Michael Flynn and Will Fitzpatrick, and they are here, and they're going to talk a little bit about the Boys and Girls Club and introduce us to some of your friends. But Kristen, first, what is the mission of the Boys and Girls Club? Um, do you want the exact mission? I want to know it verbatim, you know, chapter and verse. Um, and then tell me how Shaquille O'Neal got into the Oh, he's in the Alumni Hall of Fame. This is what I'm saying. Him so how and do you, his uh, mother, actually. Where's the next Shaquille O'Neal in this group? I got to interview Lucille O'Neal when she got inducted Wait, into the Alumni Hall Shaquille of Fame. Shaquille O'Neal, there's a Lucille O'Neal? There is. Uh, O'Neal? Yes, Fine. there is, his okay. mother. Didn't they do a, a nose commercial with like they a cold have. or something? Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead, go ahead. Um, the mission is to inspire and enable all youth to reach their full potential as young, caring citizens. 
Wow. Well, that's good. It's admirable. And all kidding aside, I mean, we were joking a little bit, but let me just tell you that in Ridgefield, Connecticut, the Boys and Girls Club, if you haven't been there, you got to see it. They got a pool outside, they got gymnasiums, they got art classes, they have a room where you can do homework. They have, I mean, it is a beehive of activity 24 7, sort of, uh, or at least seven days a week. It's a great thing. So what are you doing in Ridgefield uh, Boys and Girls Club and what's going on that's interesting? Oh, well, we've done, you know, we do lots of great things on a daily basis, but I have some of my high school kids here. They're from the Keystone Group, and I'm um, honored to say that we went to a, a national Keystone Conference in Texas this year, and we came home with not one, but two national program awards out of four. Whoa. So we're Whoa. here to share. They get four awards. for the whole country and we four. got two of them? and we took home two. One for teen outreach and one for academic success. I'm telling you, if you want to raise children, you got to come to Ridgefield, Connecticut. All right, what's your name? My name is Brenny Souza. Brenny Souza. We got that handheld mic. There we go. Okay, Brenny, what, how did you first become involved in the Boys and Girls Club and what do you like about it? All right, well, I... Uh, I first moved to Richfield in, in the fourth grade, um, and I've been living in Richfield for about seven years now. It can be tough. Fourth grade, you don't know anyone. You're the new yeah, kid on the that, block. That's very true. Flesh this out for us. I know. <laughs> so I first uh, went to the Boys and Girls Club because my mother introduced uh, me to the club. Uh -huh. And, you know, ever since I, I learned so much from it, you know, like I've said before tons of tons of times, you know, it's given me a sense of leadership. You know, I've learned to be myself, you know, I, I've built a personality there, and uh, it's, I don't know, it, it's just such a great place to be, you know, it's a great environment, it's a positive environment, you make new friends every day, you know, no matter, you know, uh, the day, the event, it's, it's just a great place to be. So how did, what did you have to do to win this event? Did, I mean, did you like, you know? Well. Create a Can soap I pass it along yeah. to Danny? Danny, 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 Danny yeah. tell, well, first of all, how did you first start going to the Boys and Girls Club? Um, well, I first began at the club when I moved here from California uh, about six years ago, and I didn't really know anybody, so it was a place for me to go and meet new people and get involved with the community, which is what I really wanted to do. So um, that's what how I first got involved. when you first moved here? Uh, fifth grade. Fifth grade. Again, it's a tough time. It you is. You come in, everyone is. knows each other, you're the new kid. Yeah. All right. Um, so this award, we won two of them, one of them for teen outreach, as Kristen said, another one for um, academic success, and uh, in Keystone Club, which is our high school youth leadership group, mm -hmm. we have different committees, and I was the head of the academic success committee, so with my committee we planned and executed a um, book club, an after school book club for elementary school and middle school kids to help them and encourage uh, reading after school and uh, literacy. Now so. would you like tally up how many books you, how, how many books, what, what was the? Uh, last like? year all the kids over eight weeks read a total of 187 books. That's impressive, that's so. impressive. So these awards are sort of a group award. You know, yes. That's a, okay, all right, now you, what, what's your name and what did you contribute to winning this award? Besides your sparkling personality. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll stick up for Reese. This is Reese's first year in Keystone, and these awards were based from last year. So am I coming on a little strong for Maybe. Reese, or can he handle it? I think he can, he can handle, handle it. it. All right. right. Uh, well, should I start how I got at the club? Please do. Please do. I can't really recall what grade it was, but I remember I was at the original club grade. for... Second grade. Second grade. Whoa. Walking down from VP every, every day. <laughs> uh-huh. I just looked at the club like a place to go after school and as I've grown and met new people at the club and it kind of became a, uh -huh. a like a safe haven yeah, somewhere you can go to get help with your homework well not really my homework like somewhere where I can like talk to everyone everyone kind of can relate to me and we can talk about something and it's like not like everyone will realize it's Kind of now you're about. involved with uh, the Torch Keystone yeah. group as well, and yes. you guys just hosted a summit. Did you help out with that summit? Because that was hosted right at the Ridgefield uh, uh, Boys and Girls Club, right? Uh, yeah, we uh, we Kristen planned it and organized it, and we kind of just made it flow and had everything working good with it. Excellent. All right, now 
I'm going to ask uh, uh, these leaders like Mike Flynn and Will Fitzpatrick. So, but not that they're even here. What are the leaders like, really? Are they a little goofy, <laughs> overbearing? Do they let you have a good time? You can be honest. Not a lot of people watch this show. <laughs> uh, it's sometimes they could be funny and joke around, and that's what the club's about. And then most times it's get down to business, get everything done. I think that's really what the club's about. And helping out in, in the community. Excellent. All right, I want to, I want to meet Will Fitzpatrick. Now, Will, uh, if you, oh, you have, that, you have the yeah. mic. You're all set. So uh, what's your involvement with the club, and how, how did you get involved, and, and what, do you, what are your goals? I mean, as far as do you, do you need to keep a heavy hand on these youngsters, or there'll be chaos everywhere? Or what, what's your well, A little bit. Um, one thing is I'm the athletic director, and oh. we have the gym is a very popular place in the club. Okay, yeah. Kids always in there. But uh, the middle school, that's, uh, that's a tough place, a tough time for kids. It is, yeah. Um, I'm the Torch Club advisor, okay. as you said earlier. And really the goal of Torch Club is to provide the kids that are in middle school, going right. through the rough patch, a peer group where right. they can find support from others. Uh -huh and also have a lot of fun while doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every time I go into the Boys and Girls Club, I work a little bit on the board and stuff like that. It just seems like kids are having a good time. And you know, as a father of three that, that grew up, my son especially went through the Boys and Girls Club, you just knew if you got him there, it was a safe place. There wasn't gonna be a bunch of drugs and alcohol or anything like that. And there were gonna be young people like yourselves that are providing good role models and parameters and just, Keeping kids on the straight and narrow. Do you have any kids? No. Are you married yet? Anything like no. that? Okay. If I'm no. getting too personal, not, not just married yet. Up. Mike will tell you. I, I have no fuel. We tease Maybe them. go we five years. 230 kids all summer long. <laughs> See, you guys, you guys are getting a lesson. Right. Yeah. But when you have kids <laughs> of your enough. own, you're going to want a good boys and girls club, uh, oh, you know, where you can drop them off. All right, now, Mike, you're, what, you have like a massive title with this boys and girls club, don't you? I, I have a, a, uh, the title of Director of Operations. There you so go. I oversee sort of all the day-to-day -day programs and staff and kids and all that kind of thing. All right. Now, I mean, when all kidding aside now, when you guys win these awards, I mean, how many other Boys and Girls Clubs are there across the country? There's over 4,000 Holy clubs, smokes. So and and you guys are coming away with these awards? Pretty, uh, pretty neat thing. Yeah, we've wow. come a long way with the, with the Keystone Club and the Torch Club kind of feeding into the, the Keystone Club. So mm -hmm. the, the middle school program has been very strong and the high school program has really, you know, um, really gone to new depths under, under um, some new leadership and what Kristen has been able to do inspiring these guys. And mm -hmm. it's really turned into a peer driven program, which is the idea. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the efforts that they put in to uh, nominate and, and work towards um, you know, things like academic success, things like teen outreach, right. you know, is really a peer-driven um, initiative that they've taken. And, and it's very impressive. I mean, I don't, I don't know that, um, you know, five, certainly not 10 years ago when I started, but uh, even five years ago, yeah. would we, you know, thought this possible. That's so right. Now you have also, and, and I've seen, because uh, I know some of the kids, but you also stay in contact with these kids after they graduate from the Boys and Girls Club, which is essentially, they can be in leadership positions through high school, mm -hmm. which I think is one of the unique yeah. thing about Boys and Girls Club. They can come in as a grade school student and just, you know, have fun, dodgeball, and do everything else. But then as they get older, they have opportunities for leadership and they can become counselors and so forth. Talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, and I think that's the most unique thing about clubs. I mean, as I look at all the young people we've brought here, um, you know, they all came and started in second, third, fourth grade. Yeah. You know, I can, I, and, and with the exception of, of Lily, who's really come on in the front row there as a yes. leader in our Keystone We're going to get to them on the front <laughs> row. But, They're um, just down there looking we cute. We will get but to they, them. We, they are going um, to ta tell us about But, um, you know, as, as they begin their experience with the club, it is about having a safe haven and people mm -hmm. that care about them and fun things going on. And as they get older, whether they directly realize it or not at the time, these leadership opportunities, the chance to have a sense of belonging and influence around the club really, you know, opens them up to stay you know, involved and us able to retain them through graduation. Yeah. So, um, Among other things, the Ridgefield Boys and Girls Club, every Thanksgiving has a turkey trot 
which is a 5K run. And if you run in that, you can have three pieces of pumpkin pie later in the day. At least that's what I've convinced myself, although I'm sure that's not the case. Uh, my goal is to always beat the guy in the turkey costume. Sometimes it's nip and tuck, but usually I can beat him, and that's my big uh, one. But uh, it's, it's fun to see some of the kids that were involved come back. It seems mm -hmm. like they come back then. They do. They've gone on to college and done well. What have you seen of, of some graduates of the Boys and Girls Club? Yeah, like I said, I think it's a very unique thing in, in any community, and certainly in Richfield, that um, you know, mm -hmm. they have such a strong connection, and, and the club really influences them uh -huh. um, so strongly in their life that, you know, they become college graduates and you know mid twenties and on, and, and they continue to stay involved. And yeah. um, you know it's a really unique thing, and, and it's it's a place where kids grow up, you know, and that means something to them, and they take that with them. You know? Some of the some of the celebrity endorsers now help me with it. There's uh, Shaquille O'Neal, and then and who's the other guy? Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington. Denzel's, the big, the big Denzel's the big guy. Yeah. And who Jennifer was? Lopez. Jennifer Lopez, Boys She's and Girls a Club. a big one. Ashanti's right. a big one. All right, all right, all right. Well, now we want to go to the front row uh, to these young ladies. Uh, state your name. Hi, I'm Alyssa Alt. And how are you? What's your involvement in the Boys and Girls Club? Um, I am a senior in high school, and I'm there uh, like every day after school. And I started off coming a few times during elementary when I moved here, like middle of second grade. And I mostly got involved when I was going into freshman year of high school. And my mom was like, oh, you should go LIT. And after that one year, I got addicted to the club and couldn't stay away ever since. Wow. Now, are you, are you helping out like this summer? Are you going to be a counselor at the summer camp and things like that? Yes. Uh, last year, I worked with uh, Minis, and I'm working again. Do you remember when you were in like second, third, and fourth grade, and you'd go to summer camp, and you would look at those counselors? Did, weren't they like the coolest people ever? Yeah. And now you're one of the counselors. <laughs> yeah. Kind of blows you away, doesn't it? It does. All right. And who's your friend right next to you? I'm Chloe, and I started going to, to Boys and Girls Club in fourth grade, and <laughs> Sorry, and I was a little bit shaky about the counselors, but after I got to know them, I sort of got more attached. Great. Now, do you go to the Boys and Girls Club like after school yeah. and, and things like that? I, uh, what are your two favorite things to do at the Boys and Girls Club? I like Power Hour and Club Tech. Okay, now see, you're talking in, in inside yeah. baseball talk. <laughs> what is Power Hour? Well, Power Hour is something that Kristen did because other clubs were doing it. It's when you do your homework and you get points. And once you get five points, you can get prizes. Like you can win a raffle or you can get bookmarks and books based on Boys and Girls Club. Great. So, I mean, it kind of makes your homework time fun rather than sitting at home and having your mom tell you you got to do it at the kitchen table. Yeah. All right. And well, to introduce us to your friend right next to you. I'm Lily Dameron and I'm a sophomore. Sophomore in high school? Yes. And are you helping out in a leadership program as well? Yes, I am. I'm part of Keystone, and I have been for the past year. All right. And how are the boys at the Boys and Girls Club? Are they nice or are they kind of <laughs> cooties? Uh, they're nice. They can be a little rowdy at times, but they're nice. <laughs> yeah, you'll find that with boys. That's how that, that is. Well, listen, I want to thank you guys very much for coming in. And uh, Kristen, what do you have? 30 seconds to tell the vast viewing audience uh, what your goals are for the future for the Boys and Girls Club and uh, how their kids can get involved. Uh, it's easy, you know, stop by any Boys and Girls Club, whether there's one in Ridgefield or in a surrounding town. There's 17 in the state of Connecticut but alone. But Ridgefield's the best, but go ahead. Ridgefield is the best, <laughs> yeah. um, and we love visitors, so stop in any time. Um, and, you know, I hope that we can continue to improve on our programs to highlight the great kids that we have in Ridgefield oh. and to continue to you know, provide them with fabulous opportunities they might not otherwise have. Guys, thank you so much for coming in. We're proud of you. Uh, you reflect well on Ridgefield, Connecticut. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next time, too. Thank you. Okay, stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. This is free television, and we're going to hear about the Samaritan Health Clinic right here in Danbury. It's free. They're having a garden party, and we're going to meet Eva Tan. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
free lunch, no second helpings, no streets paved with gold, no promise, no certainty. In this state, life is a bitter struggle to survive with the least. It's home to one out of every 11 families in America. It's home to one out of every six children in America. It's home to more than 32 million people. It's the state of American poverty. And if you were poor, you'd be home by now. Why is it you two have so much trouble communicating? I don't like the way he talks to me. He doesn't have to use that kind of language. All I said was that you had a big osteo fight. <laughs> oh, okay, well, what about the secrets you kept from me? Oh, so I didn't tell you about my drug allergies. Big that deal. That could have been nasty. Ooh. Okay, okay, so how come I always have to go to your place? I'd be happy to come to you, Judith. I can't fit the x-ray machine in my car. <clears throat> How's your shoulder doing, anyway? Fine. Yeah? I worked up to three pound dumbbells yesterday. Really? Oh. Just three weeks after surgery, that's pretty good. Yeah? Communication is the best medicine. A message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Group hug. Welcome back to the Marty Heiser Show. This has just been an incredible show. We've uh, heard a lot about a, a, a Navy SEAL who unfortunately perished in Afghanistan close to a year ago defending our freedoms. Then we had an opportunity to meet some of the uh, members of the Boys and Girls Club in Ridgefield, Connecticut. And I think we're saving the best for last because I'm joined now by Eva Tan, who is the executive director of the Samaritan Health Center, uh, Health I Clinic. Know. What would your title be? Executive Director of the Health Center. Health Center, yes. Samaritan, Samaritan Health Center. Samaritan Health Center is located downtown Danbury, 13 Rose Street. Uh -huh. If you know Danbury well, then you should tell me that it's the old furniture store. Oh yeah. Yes, a lot of people say, oh, that's where you are. That's where we are. The old yeah. furniture. It's been completely renovated. Absolutely. It's and beautiful. Pathways Academy is there? Yes, there's a lot of programs in that little building. Uh -huh. And um, it's a little jewel in the crown, as it were. Yeah. Uh, if you, don't, you have never been in, you've got to come in and say hi and see what is in there. There's a lot of treasure hidden Absolutely. in that building, right? All right, we're going to show, we're going to have a close-up of the, the photographs here as they kind of roll forward, and we're seeing some kids there being taken care of. But when someone asks you, what is the Sam Samaritan Health Clinic, what, what is it exactly? Samaritan Health Center uh, opened our doors about three, year, three and a half years ago. And um, it's a free clinic. Uh, we serve children who have no insurance. Okay. For whatever reasons that they do not have insurance, um, you can imagine it can be for a variety of reasons. Right. And especially in the last couple of years with the economic downturn, mm. um, our, our line of uninsure is getting more. So it is a place that we serve the children um, who do not have the uh, opportunity to be insured medically uh -huh. when they need a doctor they really don't know where to go uh -huh. so that's where we are uh, over three years we have collected over a thousand patients a thousand patients yes and now, we, do they is do they pay anything I mean if they have some insurance or some ability to pay is it absolutely free it is a free clinic we do not bill and we do not charge but we do we do um, ask that if you if it is in your ability to do so mm -hmm. and you're welcome to contribute towards the next patient come after you All so right. 
Uh, at the same time, we're not just providing healthcare at the center. We also have the ability to make a referral to specialists. Mm. For example, uh, we have a, an accident uh, after jumping on a trampoline. Instead of going to emergency room, she called and said, can she come in to see us? And after that, we actually make a referral for the bone doctor right. so that she can get treated without going to the hospital. Excellent. Now, what, now do you find uh, that if, well, let's just paint a picture. A, a single mother with three kids, yes. she's having trouble making ends meet. Yes. Now, if, if a child becomes sick, would she be reluctant to go to the doctor because she knows there's going to be a copay, or she just doesn't have the money, or her insurance has lapsed, and, and then they put medical attention off for the children, and then they hear about you and come to you? Is that what you find a lot? And, and, and what would you advise parents to do otherwise? We do, but unfortunately the stories we get is often is a little too late because they wait it. They, they have a baby having a fever, then you ask them, how long is baby having have fever? It could be a couple of days because they are reluctant to go. Right. Or the other way is to go to the emergency room and say, that's the only place I could go that the doctor will see me without money up front. Yeah. But then they wait for a few hours and they normally are not emergency. Yeah. So by coming to Samaritan actually reduce the number of visits at the emergency room in Denbury Hospital. Now, well, do you find, uh, will the emergency refer patients to you or are you a... Uh, uh Sometimes after the emergency room visit, when they need a follow up, they usually will call us and say, so and so do not have insurance, would you mind give them you know, uh, an opportunity to see them afterwards, make sure everything is good. And, and you're, you've been there three years? Almost three and a half. Has three and a half years, has a patient ever been turned away from the Samaritan Health? We, I don't believe we have. Uh, we encourage appointments, even they walk in, 99% of the time we uh -huh. make an opportunity to serve them. Okay. And we not just provide health care, we do care. Wow. Um, okay, now coming up, I understand uh, that there's a young lady in Ridgefield, Connecticut that's putting together a garden party. And, uh, it's going to be a beautiful garden party. Okay, now, <laughs> now this is some of the outreach events that you do because it, it is a charitable organization so people can make tax deductible tax deductible donations to it. Absolutely. But how do you go about raising money? Where does your money come? Do you get money from the government, from churches? Where do you get it? We do not receive any government money. We do not receive any grant as such. Every dollar donated is by private donor, foundations. People just want to help. They're less fortunate. Mm -hmm. And this is their time. And you never know when your time is going to come. Yeah. And if you are being blessed, you can be a blessing to others. Now, now uh, some of the, I, I, I happen to know some of the doctors that are there, they have some pretty interesting stories how they ended up at the Samaritan Health Plan. Can you tell us some of those? Sure. My doctor currently uh, was um, in Nigeria for three years with his family as a missionary doctor. Mm -hmm. and. Um, he felt that it was time for him to bring his family back two years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we hear that he was coming back, we just wanted to see what his future, his future plan was. Then as he discovered that she came, he came out to the Samaritan Health Center for just to look around, yeah. and he felt that this is my mission field. Huh. So huh. he stayed. Wow, so he was a missionary doctor overseas in Nigeria, which if you read anything in the newspapers, it'll tell you Nigeria is a pretty hectic place to be, especially if you're a oh, Christian. There's yes. actually people being martyred there. Yes. But he came back from the mission field, came into the Samaritan Health Clinic. Now, is Samaritan Health Clinic part of the Greater Jericho Partnership? We're under the umbrella of Jericho Partnership. Uh -huh. Under that umbrella, Currently, we have 11 program, ministry programs, right. and we have 21 church members. Yeah. So the church member obviously helps with the ministry programs. Right. 
So all together, we collaborate, we serve the community, mm -hmm. and um, we want to transform the city mm -hmm. of Denver. So people, I mean, it's a, it's a non-denominational, non-sectarian, but at the same time, you have the ability to not just heal people's bodies, but also to share them share the gospel with them, that Jesus died for their sins and that they can surrender their life to Christ. Do you find people coming to a decision like that uh, through your ministry? We actually have three um, middle school children pray to accept Christ in the doctor's room really? with a doctor. Um, Was it like a prescription? Like he said, <laughs> I take two Jesus and call me in the morning? Or how did that work exactly? Is is when they open up to really talk about their life, their emptiness, what mm -hmm. they need, what they are lacking, and what their family life is like. And uh, we ask for permission, can we pray for you? And uh, when they do say yes, then uh, we go on. And, wow. and some of them do come in with quite a lot of knowledge. And it's just an opportunity, perhaps. The Samaritan Health Clinic. Uh, people want to get in touch, they can Google Samaritan Health Clinic. If they want to go to the garden party, just go to Keeler Tavern tomorrow. Thank you so Absolutely. much for coming in. Thank you I really appreciate me. it, and thanks for your work. Join us next week when we're going to be joined by Linda McMahon. Yes, that Linda McMahon. She'll be on the show. I think we're replaying it. Then there's a guy with a tattoo head, and someone else is coming in. Always go to the Marty Heiser Show where you always get the truth. And thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next week.